Welcome to yet another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Miro and I'm a product manager for Oracle Corporation. Now in today's episode we're continuing along with the ADF Architectural Pattern set of episodes. And in today's episode we're going to look at a very important pattern called the Sum of the Parts pattern. And the Sum of the Parts pattern, when we look at it, will once we realize the benefits, open up a whole bunch of other options or other patterns that we can utilize. Now before we actually start delving into the sum of the parts pattern, I'd like to just give a little bit of a recap where we've got in this mini series of episodes. So basically what patterns have we looked at and where are we going in the following episodes? So what we've looked at at previous episodes in the ADF architecture pattern set of episodes is, well, first of all, we looked at the small and simple application architectural pattern. And one of the main qualities of this particular pattern is everything is contained in one workspace. However, in the colossal pattern, where everything is also contained in one workspace, we introduce the concept of the bounded task flow or the BTF. And as we know in JDeveloper 11G, bounded task flows are a key architectural piece. They give us an incredible amount of power, both technically and from a requirements perspective. And in terms of colossal pattern, well, it became colossal because we were adding many bounded task flows to the overall application. What we're going to look at in today's particular episode is the sum of the parts pattern. And this really realizes the benefits of bounded task flows, but takes it up one further step. Really uses one of the main benefits of BTFs that wasn't realized previously. And we're going to talk about that now. So what are the design characteristics of a application built on the sum of the parts pattern? Well, unlike the previous patterns where we had one workspace, one of the things about some of the parts pattern is we're actually going to have multiple application workspaces or multiple J developer workspaces as such. Now, what you're going to have is one workspace called the common workspace. And the common workspace will include a model project with all your business components and other projects for reusable components such as page templates, decorative components, and so on and so forth then you're going to have one to many more workspaces containing your bounded task flows. Okay, so each workspace may itself contain one to many bounded task flows, but ultimately you're going to have all these bounded task flows wrapped up in a workspace, maybe multiple workspaces across your application. Then finally, you're going to have one final workspace called the composite or the master workspace. And through the common workspace and its projects and the bounded task flow workspaces and its projects being published as ADF library jars, the master workspace will then consume all of these components as the master, the composite, bring them all together to create the final application containing internally an unbounded task flow. Like previously, now let's have a look at this particular architectural pattern diagrammatically to help you under understand what I just described. So as mentioned, the sum of the parts pattern will start out with a common workspace and the common workspace will include your ADF business components in a model project, your entity objects, your view objects, your application module and any extension classes as such. In addition, you will have other projects for say, task flow templates, page templates, and so on and so forth. All the reusable parts of your application, okay? And the ADF framework has a lot of reusable artifacts that you can make use of across your applications as such. Now from there, you're going to publish all of those as ADF library jars. Okay, so an ADF library jar is a proprietary jar format that um, JDeveloper IDE is aware of, it generates, it knows how to read, particularly through the resource palette. Now, from here, we will have one to many bounded task flow workspaces. So the bounded task flow workspaces will include a view controller project and one to many bounded task flows and the associated fragments. In the diagram here, I've got two bounded task flows, but you could have lots, okay? It really doesn't matter too much. The diagram is just limited by space. Now, obviously, this bounded task flow workspace is reliant on some of the things from the common workspace. So, for instance, the BTFs might be reliant on the model project, might be reliant on the task flow templates, and so on and so forth. Now, in this diagram, we have one bounded task flow workspace, but you might have multiple bounded task flow workspaces. And this could be one or 10 or 50. There's really no limit in, in, this, in this particular architectural pattern. The main key element is that we put the banner task flows into separate workspaces. 
from there those one to ten hundred banner types of workspaces in turn will be published as adf library jars and they will be reconsumed by the master or the composite application which has its own view controller has its own unbounded task flow which brings all the bounded task flows together so it's the composite it's the master it's the guy that orchestrates the final application Finally, from there, we have one build and deploy artifact and application ear or enterprise archive. Like the colossal pattern that we saw in the previous episode, the from a design consideration perspective when using this new pattern, that is the sum of the parts pattern, we still have the issue about what the granularity of our banner task flows is. This particular pattern doesn't really solve that problem and you'll find none, none of the patterns do. But it is still an issue that you need to well work out should you be creating really large banner task flows or very small banner task flows and how you're going to be consistent across your application development. But an interesting question that the some of the parts pattern brings in that the previous episode didn't show in its the um, colossal pattern is the fact that now we need to wonder or consider from a design perspective in our banner task flow workspaces what BTFs go in that workspace. Is it one BTF per workspace? So you end up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of banner task flow workspaces. Or is there some sort of logical grouping for banner task flow workspaces based around, well, I guess business function or technical function? Don't know. And this is something that you'll need to decide. Again, the ADF team, the product management team doesn't know your requirements. The, you know your requirements and you've got to come up with some sort of boundaries yourself. This is something for you to design and consider. In addition, like the previous pattern as well, once we're using banner task loads, we also get all the additional functionality with banner task loads that comes along. And as we'll see in future episodes of the ADF Architecture TV channel, that the banner task loads has some very powerful transaction options associated with them. However, I haven't talked about those, but I promise you we will cover that in later set of episodes. A final consideration from the design perspective of this particular pattern is, hmm, now those bounded task flows in the BTF workspaces are being consumed by a master application, a composite application, just one. But what happens later on if we want them to be reused by other applications? Hmm, should we design those bounded task flows for reuse now? Should we put optional parameters in them and additional functionality for some sort of future reuse effort? Or should we not and just build them for purpose and use them in the current application? Now you can see that that particular question is a very powerful one, a very important one, and one we're not going to answer right now. But it is an interesting issue because when you think about it, ooh, when you add additional code to those banner task flows to make them reusable, that's a great thing. Reuse is a fantastic thing. That's what we were taught back at university when we were being taught about programming languages. But reuse can be taken too far. You can build all this extra functionality in to all, as example, in ADF your banner task flows. But in the end, are all your banner task flows going to be reused? How do you know? Have you built that future application yet? Definitely, this is going to be a challenging situation. In considering the advantages of the sum of the parts pattern, what we now can recognize is that with bounded task flows, rather than just having them locked up in one workspace for the master application, now that we've put them out into their own workspaces, we've got this really strong advantage coming to the fore through the publish and subscribe mechanism of the ADF library jar. We've got reuse. Those bounded task flows, yes, they might be used or consumed by your master application, but down the line, you've now got the opportunity to reuse those bounded task flows, the workspaces and all the BTFs associated with them in other applications. That is fantastic. If you think about that from a typical web design perspective, most websites, when you build a page, you cannot reuse those web pages and other applications. You might be able to wedge them into an iframe, but there's all sorts of technical issues with that. But with the BTF construct in ADF, we've got the ability now to use those BTFs in all sorts of ADF applications. This is an awesome feature. In addition, 
the bounded task flow and those workspaces as we've broken them out in separate workspaces so maybe you have multiple bounded task flow workspaces and you even have the bts separated out from the common workspace and the main application you have a fantastic architecture piece that's drawing clear boundaries in your application that here's a set of bounded task flows here's another set of bounded task flows here's another set of bounded task flows you've created clear delineations between them it's like um, building a warehouse where you've actually got separate warehouses where certain items go in one warehouse and certain items go in another warehouse. And the major advantage is they can't pollute each other. So think of this from a coding perspective. You now have a better modularization or the ability to loosely couple those BTFs from other BTFs. This is a fantastic feature because, for example, now you can say, hmm, that bounded task flow over there in that workspace broke. Now, that bounded task flow over in this workspace didn't break, and therefore, if we need to test our fix to this BTF, do we really need to test a fix to that BTF in that other workspace? No, we don't, because we know they're actually separate. We know that potentially they don't share bounded task flow code. So we've got these building blocks that are really segmenting parts of our application into clear modularized pieces. And this is a fantastic advantage to our overall build and architecture. In addition, if you think about that testing perspective where, well, okay, that bit broke and this bit didn't, now when we have to perform a, a regression test of our application, you may, well, from a, I guess, a pessimistic perspective, you may regression test your whole application again, but you do have the opportunity sometimes to go, well, if there's only a little change to that little bound of task flow in that overall workspace, maybe we don't need to regression test the whole application. We only need to unit test those set of bound of task flows and we'll have some level of confidence that the whole application will still run. Now don't get me wrong there, there's still going to be situations where you need to regression test your whole application. But in the previous architectural patterns, well, because all the code was mashed together, you were never really sure that a little change there wouldn't affect the whole application. But now with this breaking up of your application workspaces, well, maybe you've got a better chance to segment your testing rather than having to undertake a full regression test, which can be quite expensive for well some organizations. The next major advantage of this particular pattern is the fact that, well, previously when everything was mashed up together in one workspace, there was no delineation of responsibilities amongst your projects and your team members. I mean, think about it. When something broke in the previous workspace and all the code was there, potentially coupled or not, and your programmers were never quite sure, particularly in the colossal pattern when you had so much code, and something broke, I mean, I've been in projects in that situation where the developers go, well, I don't think it was me. And another developer goes, well, it wasn't me. The advantage of the sum of the parts pattern is when you've got a bounded task flow and a bunch of, uh, sorry, let me say it again, a bunch of bounded task flows in a workspace, another bunch of bounded task flows in a workspace. What you can do at the design phase and the development phase is you can go out and say, hey, you, developer or set of developers, you're responsible for those bounded task flows. And, oh, you over there, you're responsible for those bounded task flows. And, oh, that bounded task flow broke. So, hmm, was that your responsibility? No, it wasn't because it's not in your set of bounded task flows. But, ah, developer A and B and C, you were building that bounded task flow workspace with those three bounded task flows and one of them broke. Who's responsible? You are. You go fix it. Now, that might sound a little bit melodramatic there, but as an ex team leader, one of the things I realized when having a number of younger or a number of senior developers working for me, that previously, before we had the ability to give bits of code and responsibility to, when things broke, developers tended to go, eh, not my problem. But when you start giving direct pieces of code, a workspace, direct pieces of code to developers, and you give them ownership, that ownership is a very powerful thing because then those developers feel very responsible for when things break. And as an ex-team leader, I felt greatly empowered to say, hey, you, fix that. You've introduced a part of your problem, you've introduced a problem into our overall application. It's obviously your problem, go and fix it. You're the team that's responsible. And you guys over there, thanks for doing a great job. You go and work on the next part of our overall application development. In considering some of the disadvantages of the sum of the parts pattern, well, 
If you think about how we've got a master workspace that is then dependent on a number of BTF workspaces that themselves are dependent on a common workspace, what we've just introduced into our overall build architecture is dependency management. That you're going to have to build these workspaces, the ADF library jars and the resulting ear, in a very prescribed fashion. And while JDeveloper and the IDE, the resource palette and the projects do let you map those dependencies, you are still responsible for deploying the artifacts yourself and assembling them. At the moment, in at least JDeveloper 11G, when this episode was published, there is no build management tools, multi-build dependency management tools that would assist us in this fashion. In addition, the problem gets a little bit more complex than that because it's not just about being dependent on these other workspaces, but what about the master workspace being dependent on version 1 of that bounded TASO workspace, version 2 of that bounded TASO workspace, and version 7 of that bounded TASO workspace, that all then are dependent on what version of the common workspace? Hmm. So you're going to have issues about version management and build, and also indirect dependencies, and this is not necessarily an issue of ADF development as such, but any programming language or any programming constructs where you have direct and indirect dependencies in different version code, you're going to need to take care of all of this. In addition, we have an issue with our banner task loads where we have to have a crystal ball to work out, hmm, if we really want reuse to be a key component or key um, thing that we're interested in with our Banner Tasso workspaces, where our BTF workspaces may be reused by future applications, we're going to have to consider how to make them flexible or how to design them for future reuse. Because currently those BTFs that you're building, those BTF workspaces, their requirements be driven by the current application but you may need to make them more flexible for future applications to make use of. So maybe that means having a parameter or some parameters that maybe switch your banner task loads into read only or edit mode. Maybe you need to have some additional routers to change slightly the logic internally of them. And if you haven't built that future application, you're going to have to look into that crystal ball and go, hmm, maybe we might need this, maybe we won't. So this is a disadvantage, okay? And Building for future reuse, well, what happens if you don't end up reusing all the banner task loads? You may end up building a lot of functionality that you don't need. This is a disadvantage of the sum of the parts pattern. A final disadvantage to mention, and uh, we've got one example on the slide here, is as you start to break your application up into multiple workspaces, certain things in the overall ADF framework will, well, basically not, uh, will no longer be available to you. For example, you might know that ADF Business Components supports security and the fact that you can actually control who can insert, update and delete to entity objects and the other constructs. Now, the ADF security can only be applied at the master workspace level. There's no ability to apply security at the master level and then have it transfer all the enterprise and application roles down to the common workspace and do some sort of mapping where you have the model or the ADF Business Component objects defined. So in this case, we start to lose some of the features of the ADF framework itself. Now, truly, there's not a lot of these features that you lose, but you will get some things where, well, you just can't use it anymore. And this is probably one of the primary examples that we're aware of. So there are some disadvantages of using of this particular architectural pattern. Now, before we conclude this episode, I'd just like to look at one alternative for the sum of the parts pattern. Now, this diagram here is pretty much as you saw previously, except you might notice that on the left-hand side, we've got some space coming into those BTF workspaces. And the major change we're going to make in this alternative sum of the parts pattern is that you'll see that we're going to remove the application model from the model project of the common workspace. And then in the banner TASA workspaces, hmm, we're going to add their own model projects with their own view objects and their own application modules and potentially framework extensions. Now that raises some interesting questions. Hmm, view objects. What view objects would go in the BTF workspaces and what view objects would go in the common workspace? Well, the view objects that go in the common workspace are those for like list of values or business validation rules. Basically view objects that are going to be reused across all the banner task load workspaces. Conversely, the view objects in the BTF workspaces are view objects that, well, only are used by that banner task load workspace. Now, 
making that call is sometimes going to be a difficult exercise because initially you might put a view object in a BTF workspace and later on realize, oh, we did want it to be reusable. And unfortunately, JDeveloper doesn't make moving business components around very easy. So this is something that, well, you're just going to have to deal with. In addition, well, the application modules. The fact that we've gone from one application module in the common workspace, and that means one root application module with one connection and transaction, and we've shifted the application module to the BTF workspaces such that now they have their own root application module. Doesn't this mean that we're going to end up with lots and lots of root application modules, application module pools, connections and transactions per user session? Indeed it might. Except, let me assure you, in a later episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel, we will consider how to make those root application modules magically join up at runtime, such that the user will only take out a set of connections and, trans uh, connections and transactions with the database, which is purely controlled by you using the bounded task load transaction options. Anyway, that's something to discuss in a separate, separate episode. Finally, just the other thing to note here is the framework extensions. This would be the ADFBC framework extension classes, which you create yourself. Well, basically you can now have multi tiers of those such that the ones in the common workspace have maybe bug fixes, overridden code that apply to all bounded task flow workspaces, but the framework extensions in the individual bounded task flow workspaces only apply the fixes, the overridden code, the bug fixes, and whatever other functionality you put in there only apply to the bounded task flow workspace that you code those in. So at conclusion of this episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel and the series of ADF Architectural Pattern presentations or episodes I should say, you can obviously see that the sum of the parts pattern is a very important pattern because what we've been able to do is not only just introduce bounded task flows and some of their advantages, but now we've been able to break those out into separate workspaces that are clearly delineated as separate architectural pieces that we can then publish and subscribe to as ADF library jars. And we've got this great concept of reuse coming in, though we need to be careful about how far we go with reuse. Now in the future episodes of the ADF Architecture TV series, and when we look at these specific episodes and architectural patterns, all the patterns from here now are just permutations of this sum of the parts. And we'll be looking at some advantages and disadvantages of reorganizing the sum of the parts in order to maybe combat some issues, combat some different uh, problems that we have, but none of them will be the ultimate pattern. Again, it's all based around your requirements, your business processes, your infrastructure. There's not one pattern that fits all here. So once again, thanks for joining us in today's ADF Architecture TV episode, and I hope you'll join us for the very next episode where we will consider those next patterns for you to think about and using in your own app in your own actual ADF application development.